Good morning, good afternoon, good day, good night, uh, depending on which part of the world you are. Welcome to webinar four on building capacity. There has been quite a few webinars that, that started in the morning and some of them were about building capacity and I attended one of them. So this is a very exciting program that we will be, that I will be sharing today. Um, all I need you to do is just to relax and it's good because you're in your own home, you don't have to step on stage and then get the, the stage fright and then you have to deal with water issues and, every, and anything else. But you can, you can have a glass of water next to you in case the stage fright occurs. Okay, um, we are going to kickstart our presentation with Kelly Ann McKenna and Mary Ann Karamagi. They will be speaking to us about empowering girls to pursue STEM in Africa, an interdisciplinary OER program co-branded with UNESCO under a new pilot program is inspiring students, engaging teachers and garnering significant stakeholder interest. So colleagues, um, you, you, you have received all the information on how long you should take. So what I will do is I'll just, when, when the, the, I think Christina will help me with that. There'll be a bell ringing, isn't it? So when the bell rings, it means now it's, it's the, or it's Alan who's gonna assist me with the bell ringing or Liz, one of you will assist me with ringing the bell. And when the bell rings, you need just to wind up your, your interesting presentation. So without any waste of time, I'll ask uh, Kelly McKenna and Mary, Mary Ann Karamagi to kickstart this and make it exciting, exciting so that we never, we look forward to the next and the next and the next. So while, before they even start, uh, can you please engage with our presenters on chat and um, try to chat, to, to ask questions on the chat box so that um, when they can respond to those questions uh, during discussion time. Mary Ann and Kelly McKenna, All over right. to you. Thank you so much. Um, we are thrilled to have an opportunity to be here today. And I'm going to go ahead and share my PowerPoint. I will share with everybody that I am going to share videos. So if everybody could mute, um, I would be grateful. Um, All righty, let me share my screen here. And. All righty, so can everybody see my screen okay? Um, hopefully, and um, so again, as shared- Yes, we can see it. Okay, wonderful. So again, as shared, um, we are presenting about empowering girls to pursue STEM in Africa. I am Kelly McKenna. I am the IEEE REACH Program Manager, and I am here with Mary Ann Karamagi, who is the CEO of Silverbolt. So before I start on the program itself, I would like to touch base a little bit on technology and engineering literacy. Um, it is one of the 21st century skills that students need to be responsible citizens. Um, and in order to be a technologically literate citizen, a person not only needs to understand what technology is and how it works, but also how it shapes society um, and in turn how society shapes it. Um, yet many students actually fall below technological proficiency levels. And while there are numerous STEM OER resources programs out there, there are very, very few that actually focus on the social and humanistic context of technology. And so REACH was created. REACH actually stands for Raising Engineering Awareness Through the Conduit of History. It's an OER program that was designed for middle school and high school teachers and their students, basically secondary education. It explores the history of technology and highlights how technology throughout time impacts society, culture, politics, economics, and vice versa. Applicable for in-person and obviously remote learning, everything in the program is downloadable and it is a donor-funded program. We actually, the goals of the program is that by using historical narratives, we can engage all students in the role technology and engineering plays, provide a new lens from which students may view engineering and technology as relevant and important to their lives, and also to offer a new STEM education pathway. 
The program is also designed to enhance student skills in problem solving, critical thinking, research, and collaboration, and obviously to meet the needs of teachers. The program was developed by the IEEE. The IEEE is the world's largest technical professional organization dedicated to advancing technology for the benefit of humanity. And it is an IEEE History Center program, and the History Center is comprised of PhD historians of technology, so all of the material is vetted. It was developed for social studies, however, it is also relevant for STEM, so it is a truly interdisciplinary program, and it meets standards both in the United States, both for the social studies as well as the next generation science standards, and also the international uh, standards for technology and engineering literacy as defined by the International Technology and Engineering Educators Association. So included in the program are inquiry units or lesson plans, primary sources, which are original sources of evidence, such as an artifact or a document or recording, engaging short videos, hands-on activities, and then background information for teachers, because we recognize in the different disciplines, they may know their discipline, but they may not know the knowledge of that specific technologies history. And then we also do provide additional resources that are from our sister um, educational platform, which are those STEM rather than the social and the human context. And it's all available via a REACH website. Um, I am actually going to stop sharing and share again um, because I'm going to take you all to the REACH website. Um, so this is actually, hopefully everybody can see my website or the website here. So this is the website and it includes inquiry units or lesson plans, primary sources. You can see them all up top. If I scroll down here, you'll see the area of context that we actually work with. Everything from agriculture on through to warfare. Um, I am going to show you, if you click on inquiry units, you will actually see all of the lesson plans. We Everything from electronic music on through to the refrigerated rail car, drones. And again, it ties back to the human context. So for example, in drones, it's how does drone impact humanity. I'm going to then show you here, and I apologize, I'm going to go through fairly quickly in the essence of time. Um, this is our skyscrapers unit. This here will give you information about the unit. This is the background information that I shared with you, and you can download that as a PDF. Then you can also download the actual lesson plan. And the lesson plan Let's see if I can blow this up a little. Um, the lesson plan actually starts with a compelling question, which is an overarching question that we anticipate the students to answer. After they go through the lesson, we, bet, we anticipate that we will better be able to articulate this question. So we start with the overarching compelling question, and then we have supporting questions that once the students go through that information, they can better articulate. We also provide formative performance tasks as well as also featured sources. So these sources here are the sources that the historians use to actually create the lesson plan. So if any teacher wants to delve deeper, they can. One of the most important things about this format is actually taking informed action. So this brings it back to the students' lives today. Um, in this particular unit, we ask the students to research the impact of tall structures on contemporary society, and then ask them to actually assess to what extent do the effects of tall buildings positively impact humanity. And then we ask them to take an action. In this one, create an online campaign or write an article. Then if you scroll down even further, you will actually see a staging the question, which is information you can share with the students to give them um, some of the background information. But then if you continue to scroll down, you're gonna see all these printed documents and they're all done from uh, document one, A through C through D through B, then it goes document two. Document one goes to all the supporting question ones. Document two goes to all supporting questions two. So it was developed so that the teachers can actually pick and choose those printed documents, whether it be an excerpt from a book um, or an artifact or a photograph, they can pick and choose which works best for them in the classroom. And it is extensive. Um, so I am going to go ahead and go back now um, so that's the lesson plan, excuse me. And if you scroll down even further, so from inquiry unit to one of the lesson plans, you scroll down even further, you will see that we also have the multimedia and primary sources. If you click on primary sources, these are those 
documents that I was talking about earlier. So for example, in the, our skyscrapers units, we actually take it all the way back to the pyramids. And these, again, this one here is a patent from Henry Bessemer. If you click on learn more, you will actually then see um, that this comes from the US Patent Office. You can download this as a PDF or actually visit the US Patent Office. So it is interactive as well. I'm gonna go back again. So these are all of those primary sources. Um, and then also you can click on multimedia. And these are short videos. They're all five minutes or less that you can share with your students. And again, if you click on learn more, you can actually download these videos and share them um, or actually watch it from here. And then the next one is actually the hands-on activities. Um, so the hands-on activities, again, same thing. You can click on learn more. We provide a PDF of all the materials that you would need and also the procedure to go ahead and create the hands-on activity. So it's a fully interactive um, OER program. So I am going to stop sharing my screen again and I'm going to start again back to the PowerPoint. Um, so um, we actually then um, created uh, through an MOU, um, a Memorandum of Understanding with UNESCO, um, we began this project to work together on projects in Africa. And again, I'm going to share a video with you right now. It's very brief. Hello all, my name is Robani Sigamani, and I am the program specialist working on the UNESCO engineering program. I am based in the science sector, the natural sciences sector, in the division of science policy and capacity building. And UNESCO came upon the raising engineering awareness through the conduit of history, the REACH project, and thought that this was a great project to implement starting in Africa as a pilot project working together with the IEEE Africa Council and the UNESCO Regional Office in Uganda, and also with Silverbolt and the Smart Girls Foundation, two local Ugandan NGOs, we started implementing the project. So that'll give you an idea as to how this project with UNESCO came together. Um, and with that, I am going to actually turn it over to Marianne Karamagi, who was our implementation partner on the ground in Uganda. Thank you, Kelly. Um, as Kelly has mentioned, uh, IEEE, this project was a, 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 a branded IEEE and UNESCO. And on ground, we had Silver Bolt executing um, the project. We are not for profit that focuses on uh, encouraging people to, to take up uh, engineering and innovation uh, as, a, as a career. So uh, we worked with REACH and what we went through heavily was we had to adopt, adapt the resources to meet two things, our national curricula, but also meet the environments in which we were, we were disseminating the information. So we worked with uh, predominantly girls, these were students uh, in the classroom, this was a controlled environment, but we also reached underserved communities using a movable classroom trailer. And uh, upon completion, we had worked with over 70 teachers and approximately uh, 1,000 students uh, were impacted. Um, next slide. So why did we choose REACH uh, for implementation? Because there are a couple of OER uh, programs out there. Uh, we found REACH uh, was generally very inclusive. So it cut across all genders, social classes, geographical locations, and different levels of education. It is not one of those things that uh, it's not one of those things that says you have to have done this to in order to proceed. We found anyone whether they've been exposed to uh, engineering or not, uh, they were able to benefit from reach. Um, to reach for us had multiple impact points. This was one of the most important points for us because uh, it's it looked further than delivering knowledge. It was not about imparting knowledge. It, reach also had the entrepreneurship. Uh, what an entrepreneur would ideally need, what an innovator would ideally need, which is simply innovation. Uh, so when you see how the people in the past did it and the struggles they went through, um, we had the young learners very, uh, it's like something switched in them. Um, then, which was for us very flexible in delivering, it means we could use it in both formal and informal environments. As you know, in developing countries, sometimes learning has to become extremely informal out of 
extremely controlled environments. So it was very versatile for us uh, for different learning environments. And it was also, also very um, receptive, it was received very well because it simply talked about how technology was impacting uh, society, culture, politics, economics, and how in turn those social aspects influence technology. And this is something when you're talking to someone about skyscrapers, when you're talking to someone about electricity, um, it's not just what is the topic, but it was also showing how we got there. So how a problem led to an innovation. And these are things that were very relatable to every learner in the class. Um, next. So uh, for implementation, of course, when you're introducing a new program, you have to try um, quite a number of, of approaches to it. So we chose three approaches. One was called the 5-1, the second was called the 5-2, and the third was called the 2-3. So what it ineptly shows was uh, for the first one, we tried five days of delivering the, the program uh, or lesson plan, but we were focusing on giving one activity a day. Now, these activities were we had introduction an introduction slide to the topic. We had the history um, section of the, of the classwork. We had the hands-on, we had formative assessments, we had inquiry units, uh, which we closed with entrepreneurship and some group discussions. So what we tried was if we focused on one activity every day, um, save for introduction and history, which was put on the same day. So one day we do hands-on, how impactful would it be? Um, the second approach was why don't we use two or more activities per day? Um, but then instead of dealing with larger numbers, we break them up into smaller groups and each, each, give each group uh, a chance to, to, to fully explore uh, the, the knowledge or the information they are receiving. And uh, the third was very short, what we called our hit and run. These were two hour sessions where we delivered three activities within two hours. And we found um, while the other two were very effective in controlled learning environments, as were formal learning environments, um, the two the two session the two hour session was very um, impactful when we went out to the underserved communities uh, because it, it, we were able to offer experiential learning, which then sparked interest, created awareness, and then drove um, drove the students to 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 explore further um, this opportunity to join the engineering and 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 uh, innovation fraternity. Um, what I must add is we closed it off with entrepreneurship because we saw the link for all, but also entrepreneurship was offering um, a next step. Of course, as if you're, if you're dealing with people who have not been exposed to education, they are uneducated. Whatever you're teaching them has to have, uh, has to have a reason like what next, what next. So entrepreneurship for us was, listen, if you, if you look at entrepreneurship from these people's angles, then you'll notice the things you're going through every day, everyone else does go through. So again, to give them a bit more inspiration. Um, next. So uh, the program results were pretty good. Um, we had sustained attendance of 76%. Um, this came at a time when there was the lockdown, so school was closed, and many parents were looking for opportunities for their students to study, but it was not forced, it was not mandatory. So. Uh, Students just kept willingly appearing one with another. Uh, the next day they come with a friend. Some dropped off, of course, during this time we had a bit of instability. Um, there were elections happening. So uh, the, it wasn't really safe, but we were quite amazed as to how many people came through. Um, we had, uh, of course, because we're targeting female, we did a 75 to 55% um, ratio of female to male. And uh, the research showed us, the, the research showed the 16.2 uh, point change in knowledge. And over 72% of the attendants found every topic um, presented relevant. So as a result, um, the Uganda National Commission uh, for UNESCO, IEEE and Silver Bolt, uh, we then got an opportunity to present this uh, to over 40 teachers uh, from eight different districts. Uh, so it was called a mentorship. And this was mainly to equip science teachers with the tools to improve participation of uh, girls in STEM, of course, uh, we then had training of education champions. Now, how this came about was there's a new curricula that's being rolled out and uh, REACH was being, well, upon um, exposure to the REACH program, uh, the champions who are in charge of this curricula then uh, requested that it is, it is in, integrated to support um, the experiential learning and the project-based learning that is being rolled out right now. And uh, right now, as we speak, uh, the Ministry of Education is considering an expansion of the product uh, of the of expansion of the of the program to fully to fully be um, merged with the new curricula that's being uh, that's being rolled out. So that was pretty good news for us. 
uh, pretty impactful comp content. Um, next. So I, yeah, thank I thank you so much, Marianne. Uh, this project could not have been possible without Marianne's efforts. Um, so um, it, the final results, the international co collaboration that it has, it's led to greater capacity building, peer networking, and truly an opportunity to potentially transform education within Uganda. And as Marianne said, it's also led to some further um, opportunities. So I'm going to share another brief slide with you. Um, lastly, I would like to say that the OER program, because of Marianne's research and what she's done on the ground, it has shown that it can, in fact, be a new STEM pathway. Um, especially for girls. Due to the success of this project being an open education resource, IEEE and UNESCO, together with many stakeholders on the ground, like the Ministry of Education in Uganda, the UNESCO National Office in Uganda, the NGOs, and many others, we think that this project can be a great pilot project to implement in other countries. We would like this project to grow in Kenya, in Rwanda, in Zimbabwe, other countries in Africa, and thereafter take this project internationally. So with that, we are, that concludes our presentation. So I'll stop sharing my screen here and we are in fact open for questions. I'm not sure. That's, any that's okay. a very nice presentation. So I'm, we want I'm, to know if there are questions from the audience. Yes, so yes. Yes, there will be questions from the audience. Thank you so much, uh, Mary Ann and Kelly, for this very engaging presentation. Um, you, you finished when we were just getting into it. It shows how exciting it is, especially for STEM and, and women being excluded over the years from the STEM subject. And, and in the continent, Mary Ann will tell you that, you know, they're not even encouraged to get into that field. And this shows that it's, a, it's, a, it's something that could go beyond Uganda, it could go beyond this pilot stage. And what excites me more than anything is when the government is actually taking it over and trying to integrate it into their policy, because that's where real thing happens, when other people are actually forced to get involved in it. Thank you so much, colleagues, thank you. There are quite a few questions that have been, that have been posted for you. Um, Can I read some of them? Yes. Yeah, what are some of the challenges that you face when developing this project, that's from Olina Zad Zadko, then uh, Lema College to everyone. So challenges you faced while developing this project or this initiative. Um, I would share, I'm going to let Marianne touch base with regards to it being implemented on the ground, but with developing the actual REACH um, OER resources, some of the challenges um, we're really just getting it out there and making people aware of that it's available, as well as also it is a very unique program. Um, it was designed, like I shared early on, for the social studies versus for STEM, and everybody wanted it for STEM, but it really was is, is an interdisciplinary for both because the goal of the program was to get all students interested in STEM or at least into technological literacy. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the challenges. Um, and, and we are always looking for funding. It is a donor funded program. Um, so I will turn it over to Mary Ann to see if she had any on the ground for implementation. Okay, so mainly for implementation, our biggest challenge was proving relevance prior to attendance, um, both from the parent side and the student side. So even if the parent had the buy-in, the student was just flat out lazy. Um, they're not into education, they'd rather go to a small business. So. Our main challenge was relevance prior to exposure, uh, but that was that 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 the good thing is when the the session started, um, the friend of friends started appearing. So uh, we, we pretty much dealt with who came who came through. 
Um, the second challenge was with um, some of uh, translating uh, or delivering the classes in communities. You actually cannot deliver them in English. Um, you have to deliver them in a local language. So if some of the terms um, that are used in technology are not yet existent in, in, in our local language, then mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. we had to get a, 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 a way around it. But that was, it was really good because that was a really good challenge for us because I, I did explain to Kelly one time, at some point it was the students who were telling us that then works like this. So you'd use this term then. So um, again, it also showed uh, full comprehension. Um, by the time a student is able to, 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 to contextualize and translate for you then, it, it was showing us full comprehension. So those were the two main, um, the two main challenges that we faced. Thank you so much. There are a lot of comments that are coming through. Uh, Verena Roberts from SAK as, as to 12 primary secondary educator. I'm so excited to see such extensive resources to support our students. I'm excited to share this open learning design ideas in Canadian school as well. Thank you. You see the impact that you, you are making, they, they, they even go beyond um, these other, and, and probably your focus was mainly, mainly on the developing countries, only to find that it has other, it's so much impact in other places as COVID has taught us, because at first we thought that the problems of connectivity and ICT are our developing countries problem, but only to find that the whole world has the same problems as well. No, thank you very much for that. I'm looking for another question. Uh, on the note of gender balance in STEM from Ego, on the note of gender balance in STEM, you should also check the Fostering Women to STEM MOOCs initiative. More in that regard is available. Yes, yes, I posted something here, a link to that, which is, which is quite interesting. Because I think, I think what you had said, Mary Ann, in the beginning, women were not, people were not interested until a friend called another friend, another friend. And that's, that's the only way that we could, we, could do, we, we could do it. And the other comment, check where is it coming from? From Alexander uh, was saying, another version of mobile learning reminds me of the library bus initiative. Nice connection with a thread on what the global north can learn from the world. Uganda has been in the forefront of innovative initiatives, which would benefit everyone instead of imposing programs from the outside. And um, this is very exciting news as well, that at least people can benefit from the program that is done. But the benefit, I still think that the state has to come strong uh, in terms of supporting this program, taking it further, and encouraging schools to get involved. As, as um, Kelly re remarked, that this is a donor funding. So donors come and go, but what they leave behind is what um, the state should take over and move on with it. Thank you so much. Um, any other questions? Uh, I, I just want to make a comment uh, in a strong support for uh, the program that they have developed that is a very uh, highly welcome uh, resource. Uh, in Nigeria here, there is a particular tribe, especially in the northern part of Nigeria. Most of their girls, when they are around 13 years old, they are given out in marriage. You know, they don't have access to education. And uh, something like this can be of great assistance you know, to such a category of people. So it's a very uh, welcome idea. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think I like the idea of inclusivity, which is quite central to open education movement. It's inclusive, it's flexible, it allows them to do, and, and I was really excited about this hands-on activity. You know, when you, when you try to get students in an online space, they don't engage. They just simply don't engage. But this program is step-by-step step how to engage in an online space and how to engage in activities. Thank you very much for that. Any other comment? We have just one minute. If there's no comments, people are excited. Thank you so much. Thank you so, so much. And, and thank um, 
your donors for us that you, they have come up with this very interesting initiative. So the second speaker. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much colleagues for this wonderful, wonderful work. The, the second presenter is Gary Henley. Gary is here, I think. Oh yeah, there we go. Gary Henley uh, from Mallard Skills Commons. And, and again, he will, he will be taking us through. Please read the, the abstract uh, from, from Gary. I don't want to take time reading the abstract and then we end up not having discussions and, and all those things. So as all the people who are here will be able to read the, the abstract. Gary, over to you. Okay, thank you so much, very much. Uh, I really do appreciate being invited here by OER Global. And I just have to say our previous speakers, Kelly and Marianne, amazing work, just amazing work. Uh, I, uh, the creation of relevant curriculum, just and making that OER is just terrific. So just thank you for that. Um, uh, my name is Jerry Henley, and what I'm here to share with you today is around a free and open resource that's available for you. And let me just pull up the uh, PowerPoint for a second. And what we'll do is we'll be focusing in on career and technical education. Um, that uh, a library of resources that that's available and. Um, and, what, and I'll just say that the COVID has really created, when it comes for learning about manufacturing skills, construction, agriculture, healthcare, many of those environments in which hands-on learning became such an important element around career and technical education were really lost when COVID hit all our communities. The loss of tools, materials, safety equipment, the ability to work in workplace learning and get direct close mentoring to help make the learning relevant for uh, the, the student becomes really important. And then suddenly the, the dramatic shift that we had to move online and then how do you really make um, this transition easy with when all the other burdens around COVID hit us. So, with all the complexities that, that are involved here and how can open education resources really help us in all this process, what I've put together here is a little um, metaphor to help us really think, think through all the different elements that are gonna be important when we're moving in an online way using open education resources. And as we all know, you know, to start cooking, what's gonna be important, we need some ingredients, right? And so when it comes to education, when we can begin to think about where can, where's my cupboard, where's my supply of all the free and open educational resources. And for example, the IEEE REACH project had these wonderful integrated resources that then allow someone to bring to that environment to begin to use that. And, We'll talk about skills commons as that place where you can go to find career and technical education free materials for you to use. Now, ingredients without recipes, without what your family and your culture has, has made to bring together these ingredients. It's the know-how that people have. And I think that when Marianne was talking about the different ways to bring that IEEE curriculum into the local settings, really important to bring that local know-how and how do I really implement those things? And within open education, we refer to those as open educational practices, right? The know-how of using whatever it is that, that, that you have. Now, without a kitchen, without the equipment, utensils, without the mixing bowl and the stove, right? How do you then prepare that recipe using those ingredients? And so what we'll talk a little bit about today is around open educational services. And I think what I'm gonna share with you today is how the Skills Commons Project 
can bring to you some open educational resources, the ingredients you can use in career and technical education. Also, the practices about how would you implement the teaching and learning in plumbing, um, in, uh, in machining, things along those lines. And what are the tools that we provide you that are free and open for you to use? So I hope the cooking metaphor is helpful to see how you bring together um, all the open educational capabilities. So the, I'm gonna show you here Skills Commons, uh, just to give a little background on it. Um, in uh, 2014, um, the, um, the US Department of Labor um, had just finished expending $1.9 billion. They started in 2010 to over 700 community colleges around the, the US to incentivize them and empower them and build their capabilities to bring innovation into career and technical education. And in particular, they had an, a number of important elements of the way the, the program worked. And the first one is around all the materials had to be related to a local industry partner. So the, the relevance of the learning, and I think this is an important point that Marianne and Kelly were making, it's so critical to make what I'm learning relevant to what's gonna be meaningful for our students and employment is really critically important. And the other aspect of all the material had to have a Creative Commons license that then enabled you to freely have access to it. And that's where they invited us, the Merlot team to build the national, and this is really a worldwide repository of these materials. So first I'm gonna show you um, this is skillscommons.org, okay? And what I'm gonna show you is kind of what's in the cupboard. If you think, what are all the ingredients that are out there that are, that are available for you to use? So here's the little visualization of what's in the, in, in the cupboard. And so blue is all about manufacturing. We have healthcare and social assistance, technical services, IT, and we have educational services, public administration, buildings, maintenance, mining, quarrying, yes. agriculture, a whole variety of things. And even though agriculture, this just looks like a little bit. Education this, services, so thank you. This, this information said there's 338 materials in agriculture. So the way you can explore this as I go out in the, in the picture here, I can go out to machining manufacturing and then into details and I can click on this and this opens up a library of materials. So here are 200 and let's make that a little bigger so people can see a little easier. How about that? Um, so there's 200 materials here around uh, machining manufacturing and I can um, and just to know what's in Skills Commons, you have all types of things, syllabi, quality assurance reports, tutorials, outreach, videos, presentations, simulations, full online courses. And here's, for example, a tutorial. Now, when you think about how did, when you suddenly had to move online, what resources could have been available, freely available, to help people know how would I do surface grinding, truing, and dressing a wheel. So what Skills Commons is that online library that you can go to and begin to get those ingredients, begin to get those resources. And here is an example, I just preloaded up this video here that's up on YouTube about surface grinding. And uh, simply being able to play this here is uh, yeah, almost a four minute video that provides you some illustration to help you prepare for how I would go into using grinding wheels and tools to enable this to occur. So with this, you can begin to go into your cupboard and you can say, here's some instruction, here's some materials, videos, 
who was it created by? What was it supported by? It was part of a credit course. So it gives you various informations. And again, here's the Creative Commons license that's available. And it shows how many people have used this recently. Okay, so again, Skills Commons as a library is a service for you to use free and open so you can get your ingredients and use it for career and technical education. Now, all those resources are not the only thing that you need. So let me just go back to the um, presentation here for a second. Now, the other aspect here is, well, now, how do I put all these things together in order to create an educational program? I have the ingredients. Now, what are some of the recipes when suddenly I had to move online? How could I do these things? So what Merlot and Skills Commons did, what we put together was quickly create an OER itself that could be customized for any local or regional area for you to freely use to help you uh, move online. And so we, these are OER portals and now I'll just show you um, those. And again, these are freely available for you to use. So let me go back to my portal here. And, and in Skills Commons, we'll just go back up to the top of the, um, the website in the area of workforce solutions solutions now because people were looking for things right away. So we, re we created a variety of resources. One of them was a, um, as I mentioned, this portal that is made out of Merlot Content Builder, which is an authoring tool, free and open for you to use. And then we aggregated or curated materials to help say, how do I teach online since I was suddenly I was required to do this? So we put these materials quickly together. So here's one by the open, the online learning consortium, a handbook that might be available. Here is a simple um, little online course from a, a junior a technical college. Little mini lessons about how do you help your students get ready for being to moving online? And again, this is a, a little simple tool. Notice I didn't have to pay anything. I didn't have to log into anything. All these are available for you to use. We, we organized together. We also said labs were a real challenge. So we put together, and Merlot has a virtual labs portal. So I'm, if I'm looking for how do I teach biology, chemistry, engineering, physics, right? So here are all the, some ways that you can teach physics, bending light around density, force and motion, all free simulations to help get your students excited about these things. So just wanted to give you that first element is around creating these portals that allow people quickly to design something that was important for them. And then also, how do I help my students learn online? And so we identified a little tutorial that was created by the California Community Colleges that allows, again, no cost, no entry uh, registration. How do I help my students get organized? And here's little videos that you can provide your students to help them prepare them online. So hopefully you're getting a little bit of a sense of um, the open educational these are, you can think of these as practices. How do I do this? And when it comes to career and technical education, we also highlighted some materials that would be immediately relevant for someone to use. So if I needed to talk about plumbing and how would I do that? I can simply click on this. It opens up a PDF that gives you step-by-step -step guidance. So even though a student isn't in your classroom or working on site, they can begin to develop their understanding on how they might be able to do waterline fitting, for example, here. So with all these examples, you know, we created um, the, the OER portal, 
about how to share information and, and other things along those lines. And then what, what we did is we, we said, if anyone wants one for their regional area, for their individual campus, these are freely available. So this is an open educational service, tools um, that are available for people to use. So, um, and these are just some examples um, a, um, an institution in United Arab Emirates. We've worked extensively with uh, historically black colleges and universities. We, we've worked with the um, National Skills Development Corporation of India. Um, we have Madison Technical College in Wisconsin and we Southern University. We worked with the Georgia Technical Colleges too as well. And, um, and many others, we worked with the Philippines, we worked with folks in Egypt and, and, um, and Iraq. So all of these, that, that website that you saw, you can easily um, use that to create your custom version to support teaching and learning online with bringing these resources available for you. Now, the last thing I'm gonna show you, let me just pop back to the um, PowerPoint real quick because we just have a few minutes left is um, not only you have um, the resources and uh, technology support to help you um, move online, but one of the important aspects too is about the mentoring process, bringing um, people together. And I think, you know, when uh, Marianne talked about how to engage the girls into the STEM uh, educational process, it's the human relationships between people. So one of the things we also have in Skills Commons is a whole area around how do you um, really use online materials to help the mentoring process. So if you're doing industrial maintenance, for example, or carpentry, how could I look at safety videos about operating equipment safely online. So when I go into the workplace, when I'm using those moments where I get that mentoring, where I get that support, I can be better prepared to do these things. And uh, so we have all these resources together. And importantly, what we also have is how do you set up apprenticeship programs in different industry sectors? And for example, what we're seeing here in the area of HVAC, you'll see here's a program from Wyoming and here's another one from Mississippi or Washington DC um, around how to set up programs, building higher education, career education and industry environments to enable those things to occur. So uh, I, I hope that, um, the, and, and let me just uh, pop back to the website again um, and show you one other thing that um, uh, is important. Uh, and uh, just to try to connect it with Kelly and, um, and Marianne's presentation about supporting women, supporting women in, <coughs> excuse me, supporting women in uh, career and technical education is um, a, another very important element um, that we have within Skills Commons. And one of the things we did, for example, is in bringing in certain states, just showing you working in one state of Ohio. Let me just open it up. Here we go. And, uh, and they had a priority for bringing women into manufacturing. So Skills Commons, one of the programs has women in sustainable employment pathways. And, and right here, here are all free workshop training materials designed to support women in, um, uh, in, in manufacturing, in energy and utility, in public safety. So here are all these free online materials, how to build resumes, interviewing, et cetera, that are available for you within Skills Commons. So we have both the coming back to the ingredients, the resources for you to use, 
Here are some guidelines about practices, about how you implement them. And then finally, the services that you can actually take these materials, use the library itself and, and open educational authoring tools like Merlot Content Builder to create the materials that are just for you to help people move online. So let me stop there. I think I've got under the 20 minutes and, and provide 10 minutes available for questions, comments. Um, uh, and I, I look forward to uh, continuing to support uh, people's interest in this. And, and uh, well, I remember too, really um, skills uh, here. Let me just show you one other thing, skills commons, just so you know, even though it came out of uh, the US Department of Hi, Gary. Mm -hmm. Of labor. Let me just pop up last minute. I'll just show you two. Um, Skills Commons is um, used. Here we go. Skills Commons is used around the world. Um, and so just in the last um, three months, you can see here are all the countries. And if I go in the last year, every country in the world has used Skills Commons resources. So with that, now I'll definitely end. So thank you very much. <laughs> and um, uh, I, I hope this has been helpful for everyone. Thank you, thank you so much, Gary. You know, when you are doing something that is you are passionate about, it's very difficult to, to stop. Yeah. But, but, um, and, and I know the time is limited, but it was also exciting for us just to listen and, and because you started at, uh, us out on the dinner table, you know, you started out who is the cook and what they, what they do. That analogy for me has, has really made sense, a lot of sense, especially when you try to get people to move into an OER space because they don't understand that area at all. But if you just say to them, you know, there are ingredients, you can go shopping for this and this and this and come and make soup. Um, um, and and I, I actually like that, that without knowing what you want to cook, you won't be able to cook the right thing. So thank you very much. Uh, there's a question from Alexander who says, do you have statistics on people who adopt those ingredients? For instance, do we have a list of all the local recipes made from those ingredients by learners and teachers? I think this is very critical to get learners and teachers to contribute to the ingredients. Uh, yes, thank you, Alexandra. Yes, and, uh, and there's a few ways that, that we look at this. One is um, how often people are taking the ingredients out of the cupboards and downloading the materials for themselves, okay? And um, so here, uh, here, let me just do a quick share screen again to show you where you can see these things. Um, so, uh, let's go back, um, there we go. Yeah, and, and I'll just show you here. So this is the number of downloads in the materials. Um, and, uh, and this was before COVID started. And, and this is, um, this is like, uh, March of this year. When, when the vaccine started becoming available. And, um, and this is um, a, like a 40% increase, and this is almost 250,000 downloads of those materials. So that's one indication that people are taking the food out of hmm. Hello. Out of the cupboard, okay? okay. The other, okay. Uh, the other one is how they are serving um, the uh, these these ingredients in their own um, organization. So, um, and I'll, I'll just say, so this is uh, something. So we worked with the American University at at Rush Alakam, and and they. Um, this is their branding. This is them bringing it and then using it within their like links within their learning management system. So, 
So both at the institutional side and as at the individual ingredient side, we have that. And the last thing um, that, that I'll, I'll show you is around, um, let, me, uh -oh, let, let me just show you this, is around, um, hang on. Okay. Is around are people revising and remixing open education resources, right? So if they take the ingredients and they look at a recipe and they say, ah, I want to make my own. So this is where we are um, providing examples where one community college took some other ones and then revised, remixed and did all different things with them. Uh, and so we try to build some case studies uh, of, of those examples. So I hope, uh, Alexandra, I, I hope that was helpful in illustrating um, that the adoption. Now I will say people are good at taking and using, but the challenge in the OER environment is having them take their revised or their, their remixed materials and sharing it back into the OER library. That's something that um, I think we, we have to work on and get better at um, and, uh, and it's gonna be necessary to keep all the stuff alive. Thank you so much, Gary. I'm just gonna, it's going to be one question and in two minutes we have to be done. So this one, you just have to give us one suggestion for encouraging course developers in higher education to use more OERs from repositories such as these and or tips for how to support the faculty in the adoption, adoption of these resources. And also I will encourage you because a lot of people have asked questions. I will encourage you Gary to go into the questions and respond to those questions. And this question comes from Kate Richardson. So you have one minute of fame and that's it. Okay. <laughs> for me, affordability barriers for our students are the biggest issue. In California, where I've worked for many years, 40, over 40% 40 of our students pre-COVID are food insecure, meaning they're going hungry. 11% are homeless. And when they can't afford the content to change their lives, then they get stuck where they are. So OER is about enabling, empowering your students to reach their potential by giving them access to educational content. And if faculty don't believe in their students, then I think they should, um, I'll say, question their purpose behind teaching because teaching is a generous process. Sure. Thank you so much. I'm glad that you ended up with that, on that note where you said teaching is a, gen is a generous process and we need to encourage our learners to, to, to get into teaching. Now, I think my last, not my last, it can be my last presenter. Number three is Elena Zarko and uh, from Lemon College and Susan Cole. Those are the presenters. Um, they will be presenting. I've lost my, my, my space yet. Please help me. And <laughs> I lost my space. I'm dealing with so many web websites at the same time. Okay. But Alina Zenko from, uh, from New York City, Lehman College, okay. and Susan Ko. The topic of their presentation is OER Sustainable Scale Up Faculty Development as, as Capacity Building Strategy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Over to you, Olena and um, Olena and Susan. Thank you so much. And um, what a great pleasure to uh, for us to present right now um, after uh, so much of the work that I've followed actually with Gary um, that he has done. So I think uh, we'll be able to connect some of the dots from the earlier presentations. So without further ado and knowing that uh, time is of value, um, we'd like to thank you for being here today with us and we'll take you through um, our presentation. So um, I will um, 
get us started in just one second. Okay, so I think we are ready to go and I'll just double check. Okay, terrific. So, um, so what we have today is we will be focusing now on uh, the topic of sustainable scale up and specifically through faculty development as capacity building strategy. Um, the work that um, Dr. Ko and I have done uh, in the last five years has been really focused on faculty development and how we can engage faculty uh, in the process of working with open educational resources, integrating them into their courses, with the idea of um, adopting open educational resources um, and increasing the quality of the learning experiences that our students have without decreasing uh, the quality of those experiences. So basically reducing cost and improving um, learning experiences for our students. Um, so a couple of words about some of the work that we have done so far. Uh, so Dr. Ko and I have been working together since about 2017, um, and we'll talk much about the work that we've done, uh, and we're really eager to share with you. Uh, we've also written a book um, about best practices in designing courses with open educational resources. Chapter number four is available for free to anybody who is interested in learning more. And Dr. Ko has also written um, a book about teaching online, uh, a practical guide, which is in its fourth edition. And that very much pertains to some of the topics that Gary just talked about in terms of learning how to teach online and um, that uh, overlap between open educational resources and how it can facilitate and um, help us uh, with teaching online. So without further ado, I'm going to dive in into our presentation. And as I noted, we really do focus on faculty development as a strategy. We found that uh, faculty are the key stakeholders, of course, in addition to many of the support offices that are there to uh, provide um, uh, assistance uh, and also, of course, students. But we found that by means of meaningfully and intentionally providing faculty development in the area of open educational resources, we could certainly reach our goals faster, more efficient, um, and certainly uh, we'll be able to uh, help our students be successful uh, in the environment that's accessible and affordable. So uh, what we have learned in our work uh, pertaining to OER is that um, faculty need to know what open educational resources are. They need to know how to find them, how to evaluate them, and specifically how to integrate them into a course design plan. And um, I know that we use the terminology for open educational resources uh, among those of us who've done quite a bit of work in this area, um, uh, quite a bit, but I think for those faculty who are starting uh, to work in this area, it's really key to to start with some of the basics um, in order to establish that strong foundation for their future work. It is also very important to, for faculty to have the basic understanding of online delivery of course and course materials, right? What platforms are available? We've looked at a few of them before that with some of the open educational resources, there's already a platform uh, for posting course materials, even sometimes uh, engaging with those course materials. But again, it is really key for faculty to know what platforms are available besides the ones that we already know of. So such as learning management systems that are in many cases could be the closed platforms, um, uh, which could still work for dissemination of course materials. But again, um, it is really key for faculty to know what their options are in terms of um, sharing those materials. Also, we have learned, uh, as I've noted already, so in terms of the basic understanding how to present the content in the various formats, open or not open, right? So there are different ways uh, one can do that. Um, there are certainly some advantages to one platform or the other, depending uh, to what extent a faculty member might engage students on the platform in term and some of the key considerations for student privacy, etc. Um, uh, the other aspect is that 
that, um, as I noted, besides faculty, uh, faculty also need to know and to have the continuing support from some of the key stakeholders. We've talked about instructional designers, IT, uh, of course, librarians, and we'll talk about them in a few minutes. Uh, they are really key to the success of our work um, with, um, with open educational resources. Um, and uh, all of this is needed in order to build out and maintain uh, course materials, OER course materials. So in terms of the institutional support for OER, so this is just some context in terms of what is necessary. So for us, for example, at the City University of New York, um, uh, we have received um, uh, funding and I'll talk about that in just a second, but in our case at the City University of New York, we currently have a course an OER course registration attribute. And in our case, it's a zero textbook cost where um, students can search among a variety of courses and see which courses do not require a textbook, right? So it certainly provides that additional um, knowledge to students as they make their choices about which courses they will be registering for um, and also means that uh, faculty who dedicate the time and effort to make their courses zero textbook cost would um, uh, inform students uh, about uh, about that course option uh, as i noted in terms of funding uh, we have found that in order for this OER work to really uh, be sustainable we need to ensure that there is funding for faculty professional development and development of OER courses. We know that oftentimes there's really a lot of competition for faculty time in terms of um, their scholarship and what's recognized. Um, thus, you know, providing additional funding that would enable faculty to dedicate their precious time to working with open educational resources is really key. Um, at our case, in our case, um, at Lehman College, uh, we also have our library who's done outstanding work. And what they have done is actually they've created a library fellowship for development of open educational resources, which I think is really taking it to the whole new level because the creation of open educational resources, as we've seen in the first presentation, uh, needs to have that additional funding uh, um, uh, so that uh, we could create really uh, powerful, uh, really strong and high quality open educational resources. Faculty recognition and tenure and promotion processes is really key as well, um, as faculty uh, are often um, engaged in these activities with open educational resources that compete with the time um, that is really valuable uh, in order for us to recognize that, um, making sure that um, they do get the credit for the time and effort they dedicate to the OER work is really key. And of course, showcasing and uh, changing the institutional culture. I know at some of the institutions uh, and organizations um, uh, recognizing the, effort, the efforts um, uh, is really key so that we can um, highlight the important uh, changes in the culture and also recognize those who really are innovative and really intentional in the work of OER. So one of the things that we'd like to share here, um, I know in the spirit of the session as well, um, uh, Dr. Ko and I have worked on a faculty development workshop, which is itself an OER. So it's free, available, adoptable. You know, we invite everyone to uh, make use um, uh, of the resources that we have shared. And on this website, you'll find everything from the course materials uh, to um, we actually administer our workshop in Blackboard in our learning management system. But we have downloaded the zip file that you could import into your LMS. And in about uh, a couple of weeks, we also will be posting uh, an open access uh, Google document with all of the materials that you could bring into any um, system or platform that you would like to have. And uh, our plan is also to make sure that it is posted uh, on Merlot as well. Um, as we know, this is one of the key uh, sources for many of the faculty and those of us who are involved in OER world to uh, share and find 
uh, valuable resources. So we invite you to use this web page and we'll be sharing that in the chat um, in a couple of minutes in case you'd like to check that out. So a um, couple of things that I'd like to share is uh, about the workshop structure um, and um, how uh, we approach this faculty development workshop. I'm sure you've attended and you've sent your faculty or um, you have seen a variety of various workshops. And one key thing that we have found in faculty development, it is really important to have dedicated time, which is not one hour, not two hours, but extended period of time with some sort of a deliverable. So in our case, uh, we have designed this two week facilitated, so there's a facilitator in the workshop, fully online, asynchronous, meaning not live, um, workshop experience on OER. So the way it is structured is actually, uh, we have three modules in the workshop, and each module is about two to three days. And um, at the end of each module, there is a discussion. So all of the participants will engage with each other and the presenter of the workshop. And then at the end of the workshop, um, uh, there's an OER course design plan um, as the final project. So those faculty that engage in this OER work uh, would then develop, and we'll talk more about uh, what it looks like for faculty as they work on this course design plan, they will uh, develop a plan for integrating OER into their teaching. I know that in the first session we looked at um, uh, some lesson plans. So that would be an idea for a faculty member during this workshop to start developing uh, lesson plans for uh, their uh, course, uh, hopefully for the whole course, but at least um, getting started for two to three weeks of the course. And um, again, at the end of the workshop, um, uh, participants receive feedback uh, from the facilitators on the final project and also they receive feedback throughout in the discussion. So it's a very engaging experience. So Dr. Ko and I have started this work back in 2017. Uh, uh, when Susan worked at CUNY SPS, um, and then later she joined uh, Lehman College and we continued our work. Um, and so far we have been offering this workshop at Lehman College annually, and uh, we now have had 100 faculty who have successfully completed this workshop. Um, in terms of our approach to how we recruit faculty, so there's a general call to all, to all faculty interested in participating uh, and recommended by their departments. And uh, we have two workshop developers, so Dr. Ko and I. Um, and in terms of the facilitators, we typically have one or two facilitators, um, sometimes one lead facilitator and the other facilitators present and um, available to answer some specific questions. Um, and uh, we, uh, we we always try to involve um, our OER librarian. Um, I think I might have seen her today um, in our session. Um, but again, this is a great uh, resource. And I think for those of you who have OER librarians, um, make sure that you utilize their expertise and experience and invite them into your work that you conduct with faculty. So now I'm gonna go ahead and pass it on to Dr. Ko uh, to take us um, through uh, the workshop and some of the specifics. Okay, so hi everybody. Um, uh, just wanna say, of course, this, was, uh, this is the way we deliver the workshop, but um, on the website, you will be able to you know, use the materials uh, in other ways if you wish. You could do this as a shorter, kind of workshop, it could be a longer workshop. It, so, <clears throat> you know, because um, you can freely um, use whatever parts you want and adapt them however you like, um, just be aware I'm taking you through it the way that we designed it um, for uh, a particular asynchronous delivery. Okay, so you can see the uh, overview here and the outcomes. And this is actually a screenshot directly from our workshop. Um, and uh, so you can see what uh, Elena was saying about uh, being able to define, to understand what things are, what are the permissions, what are the licenses, what um, kinds of resources are available to them, how do you evaluate it, um, and uh, finally, 
the idea is, um, you know, for those of you who've worked in faculty development, you may, you, you already know that one of the big things is to give faculty a takeaway, right? So when they leave, they feel like they're starting something new. And uh, so you create a plan or an outline. Some people really uh, end up with quite a well-developed plan, even in a short time. Others are just, maybe they found one OER that's going to work for them and figured out where to put it in their class. The point is they go away and they can continue to work. Next. So uh, module one, uh, again, is the defining um, what is OER. You know, uh, a lot of faculty are not really clear about it. And one of the things that they do get very confused about is the differences between something that's free on the internet, but in fact is not OER, and what is OER, and what is um, uh, under copyright, and um, all those things which um, uh, uh, can be actually quite confusing uh, to a lot of faculty. Okay, so um, we get them started with just in fact, like what do you know about this already and, and um, what is it? Next, please. Then uh, in module two, we kind of get into the nitty gritty of, well, how do you find this? How do you find these things? And for some faculty, you know, they're teaching a course or in a discipline, which is really um, pretty easy for them to find even a whole textbook, right? That's completely OER. But for other people, it's very difficult, very difficult. And uh, that is something that faculty struggle with. And I think that going into this and working with faculty, it's very important to respect that concern, right? Um, faculty want to uh, feel that they are finding something that's going to be of value and meaning uh, for the course. So we go into um, all the general collections of OER, various repositories. We also talk about how could you use Google Advanced Search to find things. And we have them, in fact, do a little um, exercise where they choose one of the uh, uh, repositories, OER repositories, like could be Merlot, and they look for using, you know, their search terms, they look there um, and evaluate what they found and they look, uh, they try uh, the Google advanced search to, to see what they find. And, you know, uh, sometimes you they find something in a repository that's, they would never find with Google and weirdly enough, sometimes something comes up on, on Google advanced that they couldn't find elsewhere. So this gives them a real life, you know, hands-on experience with how do I go about finding something in my area? Okay. Uh, and I should also say because of the discussion element, um, they are then going to share in the discussion what they found and any limitations on what they found. And sometimes uh, people in the same, uh, teaching the same course or in the same discipline are taking the workshop together, which is wonderful, because then they can compare notes. So uh, that is one of the great things about having an interactive, um, even though asynchronous, there's, uh, you know, an exchange uh, uh, a frequent exchange between the participants. Okay. Module three, it gets into the evaluating and selecting. And this is something people, faculty have to really think about very carefully. Uh, and there are many different aspects to this. And originally, um, when Elena and I did this, we found a number of different kind of Craig, you know, evaluation lists that we found online that were pretty good. But over time and working with the faculty, we discovered that uh, they weren't comprehensive enough. So we ended up uh, over some time developing our own list, which is an OER, you can use it. And um, uh, next, I'll show you here. So um, this is on our website, um, the uh, workshop website, and uh, it covers some um, uh, six basic areas. Um, one has to do with, well, how comprehensive is the content? How much coverage does it provide for the topic or the course? Uh, then you get into, well, what's, how reliable is it? And how, how much currency does it have? So for example, 
you know, I deal with uh, Asian literature in translation, and I may find something that was translated that's free, it's in the public domain, but it was translated in the 18th or 19th century. <laughs> And the language is just so obscure that my students would not be able to understand that translation. Uh, you can also come up with materials which may be out of date, right? It can be that the knowledge is not current. Uh, and this is going to happen a lot in any of the um, uh, sciences, for example, but also in social sciences. Uh, now, by the way, if something is not current, doesn't have currency, it's outmoded or whatever, you know, there are sometimes you can still use it, but you'll have to add your own commentary. You may have to update it, or you may have to say, you know, this reflects, uh, you know, 19th century attitudes, but blah, blah, blah. So, um, you know, this is why it's so important to thoroughly evaluate um, an OER. Um, or any free, any, especially those in the public domain, since public domain is considered uh, you know, under the rubric of OER. How appropriate is it for the course level? You know, is it, is it material that's only for uh, beginning stages in that uh, field, or is it too advanced? Then uh, how easy it, is it to access? Like, can you actually, um, can you download it and, and re-upload it or do you have to access it on a particular site, then accessibility in terms of um, being able to be accessible to all learners. And uh, so what, what format is it in? So that's a very practical material aspect. Uh, then how customizable is it? Is it free to use versus completely open? Um, it, does it have maybe some limitations on the license? Do you care? Um, and then finally, something that a lot of faculty in certain fields are very uh, concerned about, are there any uh, time-saving resources or supplementary resources like quiz banks, like project ideas, like additional readings, um, you know, all kinds of things like this. Uh, so when you go to this, um, uh, you know, list, if you want to use this as a criteria list for yourself or your faculty, just uh, bear in mind, you are able to, you know, add your own criteria as needed. Um, and uh, I always think it's something important to consult with librarians early on in the process. This is what we say to faculty um, that uh, a lot of times there, there are there are things in the public domain or there are things that seem to be free, but frankly, um, they're not well labeled as to how you can use them or even who put them together. And this is where librarians can be so helpful. Okay. So uh, Susan, I, I, I believe you're me. already over the 20 oh, minutes. Yes. So, yes. Okay, sorry. <laughs> so well, to wind it down but, because you only have five minutes. Absolutely, yeah. I'm gonna wind it up, sorry. Uh, so this is the final project. Um, it's on the workshop site. Um, this is planning out your course next. And it just shows you, they identify the areas that um, they want to replace old co uh, former content with and what are the licensing conditions because when you're looking for things, if you don't jot that down right away, it's very easy to forget. Next. Um, so these are some things we've learned. And I'm just going to point out one that's important is faculty don't care about mixing. They don't care if they mix. OER, non-OER, free but not OER, or library subscription, uh, you know, paid for electronic subscriptions. They care about whether it's good and whether it's going to be accessible to the students. Okay. So that's the book. Next there. And we had a free webinar as well. So when you download these slides, they are on the um, webinar site. And um, we, we did a, a, a webinar for um, uh, Rutledge, which is um, linked to uh, here. Okay, thank you so much. And you're welcome to contact us. I think this is the time. Thank you very much, you don't have questions. Uh, because uh, Susan took most yeah, of I'm so time. sorry about that. I, I lost track. <laughs>
Can you answer the questions then? There was the no chat? bell. Where was the bell? <laughs> Uh, now we, we are going to ask Verena and Nicole, who are going to speak to us about Open Voice Voices project. Over to you. Me two seconds, I'm just gonna share my screen. I was answering badging questions in the chat, which I'll keep going once we get through this. All right. So hello everyone, we'll get started knowing that uh, everyone's um, on a schedule today. Um, welcome to the Into the Open podcast project, which discusses exploring open pedagogies and voices through podcasting. This is a GoGN fellowship project, um, and I am Dr. Verena Roberts, and Nicole Nutzling will also be um, presenting with me today. Awesome, nice to meet everyone and let's get into this. We're gonna start off doing a bit of a land acknowledgement. Um, Dr. Roberts and I are both actually, we've moved around a lot. So we have a few different land acknowledgements. The one I include here is from Treaty 7. Both of us work out of the University of Calgary. And so this is our territory that we are very grateful to be a part of. Part of giving a land acknowledgement in Canada too requires, not requires, but encourages an action. And so as part of um, reconciliation, my action is through this project actually bringing in um, as many perspectives and voices, especially those that are not often heard. And in that case in Canada, it's often our indigenous populations. Also really honoring the um, oral history and oral traditions that have brought us to podcasing for me. So Brino, do you wanna, your side? Thank you, Nicole. I'm just going to read in the spirit of respect, reciprocity, and truth, we honor and acknowledge Mokinesis and the traditional Treaty 7 territory and oral practices of the Blackfoot Confederacy, Siksika, Kanai, Pekani, as well as the Zai, Nakoda, and Tsutsina nations. We acknowledge that this territory is home to the Métis Nation of Alberta III within the historical Northwest Métis homeland. I also want to acknowledge that I am an uninvited visitor on the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and Mohawk territory based out of Beacon field or Montreal, Quebec. Um, finally, we want to acknowledge all nations, Indigenous and non, who live, work, and play on this land and who honor and celebrate this territory. It's also important to recognize that this week is our Canadian Truth and Reconciliation Week of Reflection, and our day of reflection is on September 30th, 2021, where all um, all educational institutions are encouraged to stop what we're doing and think about what's really going in, on in Canada in terms of truth and reconciliation and we, how we can best support our Indigenous students and peoples across Canada. Okay, so now we get to how this really connects to our podcasting. So I'm Dr. Vrina Roberts and I am part of the GoGN network and the GoGN network is the global open graduate network. So I completed my doctoral studies in open educational practices and I finished in 2019, I believe now, it was a bit of a while ago. But I'm currently an instructional designer with open learning at the Thompson Rivers University. Um, I focus uh, or I specialize and lead the ZTC, the Zero Textbook Cost Project, which is so exciting because I live and breathe open. I'm also also an adjunct assistant professor with the Workland School of Education, University of Calgary. And this is part of my postdoctoral work that, um, and you'll learn about a little bit about this as a result of um, working um, on a graduate course and leading a graduate course. And Nicole Nutzling was one of my students. Yeah, so my name is Nicole Nutzling. Um, again, I was one of Dr. Roberts, or Verena. I never know what to call you anymore. It's kind of transitioned. <laughs> Um, I was a student at the Workland School of Education and Educational Technology. I now work as an instructional designer and e-learning specialist for a couple different organizations. And I am kind of the reason I sucked Verena into doing podcasting. So why podcasting? It started out actually, I was working in the Middle East um, last year during the entire insane, it feels like about a hundred years ago, but the initial shutdown of the because of COVID. And so I had the opportunity to join in on a podcast that I found and got connected through Twitter with. And it was great because in Asia, they had locked down a couple months before we had in the Middle East. And we locked down a month or so before South America and North America. 
So it was a good way I found of really gaining a bunch of knowledge really quickly, um, changing my practice and being able to influence my practice so I could, could help my students in the best way possible as we transitioned online. And then it allowed me to really, I have a lot of, I worked in South America for four years before the Middle East. And so I was able to transition all of that knowledge through a podcast to my colleagues that I'd worked with in South America and they adapted their program. And so I was like, there's something to podcasting. There's something about being able to transmit knowledge and so rapidly using this medium. And so I wanted to explore it further. Um, Brittany, you wanna take this way? So this project came about because, as I said, we're with the GoGN network and at, with the GoGN network, we focus on our dissertation work originally, and then we think about how it can expand into different ways around the world globally. So in this case in particular, as again, we'll get into a little more detail, um, but we'll, we'll show you how my dissertation connected to teaching a graduate student course, then expanding upon the idea of open education within our university then connecting with Nicole so she was able to apply for fellowships and do her own research in open learning and finally connect with postdoctoral research as a result of the process and actually co-designing and creating open educational resources with our students um, as well as with instructors. So when we think about open learning design intervention, I just want to start with the first version, which came about at the beginning of my dissertation. You'll see my little son on the side and it really focuses on the idea of Vygotsky and, and the fact that when you give a child a stick, he sees it or she sees it in their own way and they will play and develop and, and, and use that tool in, in the way that they think it should be used or they think it could be used. So I felt if we gave each student in our courses that opportunity to, to take that learning artifact and develop their digital literacies through in, intentional interactions, collaborations, and connections, that we could eventually expand their personal learning networks and develop open learning strategies or open learning connections around the world. The second version after my dissertation evolved into a more kind of structured layer so that we I believe that it's always taking reflections and so that reflective practice became more important and there were kind of stages to open learning design so we have building relationships co-designing these learning pathways that we're talking about building and sharing like making making that learning visible showing evidence of that learning in visible ways um, building and sharing that knowledge with others and building per and that will lead to building personal learning networks. That was version 2019. And finally, the, it, it added to that is the open learning cycle. And, and you can read more about this, but it really the fundamentals are essential conditions of open learning, open ed practices and open learner awareness lead to sharing ideas and knowledge with each other. And so finally, as a result of all of this research, whoops, we missed Sorry. one. There we, there we go. So yeah, this is what we were working on when we looked at the courses that I had designed that Nicole was actually in. And we'll see that open learning design model goes from process to product. So process is the emphasis to get to that product, which can be an OER or not. And that's through reflection, multiple uh, feedback loops and co-design, as we can see here. So we chose to take this model and apply it to our podcast research. Yeah, so I think what's important to know is I went through this process with um, Dr. Roberts as my instructor, and we developed an OER, a press book. So I'd been through the process once, and I just wanted to go, I guess, subject myself to the process again, but this time with a different medium. So I'd been through this, this whole cycle one entire time, and this time I was like, hey, I want to explore open at a deeper level, but this time through podcasting. So we're going through it again. So I'll go through a bit of a timeline. So we started off um, by learning. We, I'm very fortunate through GoGN and, and through Dr. Roberts to be able to connect with some incredibly intelligent individuals. So we started doing a survey just to understand all about the world of podcasting. It was very new to me. I'd been in, involved as a, a guest in one podcast before and that was it. So we went through a learn stage. 
we had to kind of refine and define our content and focus um, and decide who to reach out to. This was a hard stage because open, as many of you know, has it's enormous, like tackling the whole thing is just somewhat impossible. So, so really refining my questions and, and what I was curious about and maybe skeptical about in some ways really helped us hone in on, on who we were going to talk to. We're currently in the building stage. So we're working on developing the actual content. I've recorded two podcasts so far. I've got a third one coming up next week and have finally finished editing, which I will talk a bit more about later on. So we're in that stage where I'm, I'm interviewing and talking to as many people as possible to start to build these um, actual podcast episodes. And then we'll get to the final production stage and then we'll move into some feedback, getting feedback and doing a bit of research on them. Part of it right now in the whole refining and building stage, we're realizing once you get going in the world of podcasting, you see what's already out there. And so we started calling this Open Voices and we're going to have to rebrand a little bit because apparently someone else also had that idea. So it's it's kind of a, I can feel like I'm completely going back and forth all the time and, and learning each and every day that I go through and, and try something new. So the next one, there it is. So the intention behind originally doing this, part of it was I wanted to bring in other voices. In North America, you generally just, when you start to get into open research as a student, there are a couple names that really pop out, but I wanted to hear from other people. I've lived overseas and in, in South America for, uh, for four or five years. And so I really wanted to bring in other voices that aren't always heard and the student voice. I came in from a student perspective and, and you don't hear that a lot of the times, especially students that are creating and developing OER. So I wanted to be able to bring in some more perspective and voice. Um, it's also about developing community. I found the GoGN community is incredibly supportive and allows me to be able to explore and, and supports me in doing things like this, but I wanted to continue developing that. And I thought podcasting would be a good way of connecting with other people and developing it. And then we wanted to look a little bit at open data um, collection. So because everything exists in the open world through podcasting, if it comes to researching and analyzing that data, what, are, what ethics are involved with with openly accessed content. Brina, I'll let you go into co-design. Um, however, as we started actually completing the research project, we realized that the co-design element was almost the most important element of this whole project. And I'm just realizing that you have a different copy of the slides, Nicole. So um, I have- Share your screen. Yeah. Let me stop. Yeah, do you mind stopping for a second? Because okay. I just want to really show. Oh, host disabled while presenting. Go back, Nicole. I'm just going to put it. You won't see all the links, but you'll get it in the uh, in the uh, the PowerPoint that we can share. So the number of different ways in which the process of this, like this open research process created OERs or different OERs. For example, that we created an EdTech ethics press book. So we created, each of the students in the course originally created their own chapter within a press book and the, the instructors and program directors also contributed. This led to a blog that supported future students um, to help them. With, we also had a hashtag, the EdTech Ethics hashtag. We also had EdTech Ethics presentations completed by students and not the instructors at things like the Open Ed Conference. We have a, what's called the Talon Network at the University of Calgary, and it's um, uh, kind of promoting innovative and different practices across campus. So we had them come and interview us to find out more about how we were connecting with students and promoting open learning and open educational practice. Nicole was able to start an open ed fellowship, which I thought was really interesting because I had the open ed fellowship and now she had the open ed fellowship. We were able to apply for this go and from that fellowship, we were asked to create blogs. And within those blogs, we are curating and collecting multiple resources to share all of this content that we're learning, all, all these different resources about podcasting around the world. 
And finally, we have an open webinar series that we've been asked to do at the University of Calgary, which is open to the world as well, where we're promoting OER, but we're also expanding upon it and using our, and, and exploring open educational practices, equity in education, UDL, and us. Uh, Kind of borrowing or adapting from the Mandela University, the open ed influencers. So a big shout out to Dino Franzman and the work that his amazing um, team is doing. Basically the never ending project or the never ending <laughs> story is what co-design has started. So keep going. Do you want to this at all? Yes. Or? So what started out as voices really around the world turned into a change in voices and direction specifically to a skeptical version of what is open all about from a student perspective. Keep going, Nicole. Oh, I'll, sorry, I'll take this one. So what we did was when we looked at the online survey, you'll, we just put the results right here. The, while we may have thought that um, we wanted voices from um, different countries in particular, maybe doing some podcasts in different languages, what the GoGN community and, and really the community that completed the, the online survey wanted were student perspectives. They wanted to hear not from the uh, the people who might be passionate and devoted to open education, or as I was told, who drink the Kool-Aid, those who drink the Kool-Aid. Uh, people wanted to hear from those who aren't drinking the Kool-Aid, but would like to learn a bit about it and to find out what's going on within the community and open education and how they can, can figure out if this is something for them. So go ahead, Nicole. Yeah, so taking that kind of critical approach and from a student uh, or a former student, I guess, at this point in time for me, um, these are kind of the episode themes that have emerged. So we started with the beginnings. We thought it would be important to situate ourselves and kind of explain who we are and why we're doing this. I pulled in Heather Van Struen as well, who's another, um, she was a former student in the course that I often reflected with as we were building an OER. So I, I'm, I pulled her in. She's got a great voice as well. So she's good for radio. Um, we're going to do one on sharing is caring with Alan. I do believe Alan's in this meeting right now. I'm really curious about the concept of sharing. I do think to a certain extent from a student perspective as well, sharing is a bit of a privilege. I'm not always in that position um, to share everything I make because I do have to pay the bills. So it's kind of, I, I'm really excited to talk to Alan about the concept of sharing. I've talked to Helen DeWard about navigating digital networks. So just what it means to be digitally literate in the open educational world. If you click on the links here, the episodes are actually uploaded. Um, we haven't posted them anywhere else yet, but you can have access to them here. Um, I'm excited to talk to Dr. Cronin, Catherine Croner, Cronin, and hopefully get down to Uruguay where I used to live and talk to a few people down in the South about open for whom. Again, it's all about equity. I've lived in different places in the world and, and I can see the power in being able to use and access OER. But when I'm working in, in Uruguay, for example, I'm getting content that's Canadian or North American usually specific, and it doesn't always work for where I'm, I'm teaching or where I'm at or, or my students and my kids. So I'm really curious about, about designing to include the global south and include those voices. Um, better together, I wanted to talk to Dr. Barb Brown and Joel Templeman is another student who was involved in the OER process, just about the idea of combining brain power and building knowledge through connections, particularly through Twitter. We did a lot of that work in our when we developed our OER. So I'm very curious about working together with others in, in networks. And then I do want to do a, um, at least one episode on reflecting on how it's changed my mind or maybe hasn't or how I want to continue working and, and where I situate myself within open education. Um, and then I'll do a little just quick if you're looking at podcasting I'm learning a lot of lessons I am not an expert in this at all, but some of the tech tools we're using. I'm using Zencaster to do all of the interviews and recording. The reason behind that is you can download separate files. So all of the voices are separate. It makes it a little bit easier for editing. I've had the odd bump in the road when it comes to Zencaster, but I'm, I'm getting it figured out. It's also a free tool unless you want to do some post-production within it, then it charges you. But outside of that, it is free. 
I'm also using Audacity to edit. Again, I'm slowly getting faster at this. It's a free open source audio editing platform. Again, I'm trying to use as much open source and free as possible. And then open audio clips, I'm realizing storytelling is really adding other audio besides just my voice in there. And so I'm pulling a lot of audio clips from Freesound and Sound Bible, which are both open source um, areas where you can get a bit of audio. And then lessons learned. Recording high quality audio is important. I'm already seeing this as a digital literacy skill for myself. I live really remotely in BC and so Oftentimes I have audio issues just based on my Wi-Fi connection, which I, I can't do much about, but I'm working on. And then editing takes a hundred times longer than you think it will. Again, I'm getting faster as I, I learn some skills and, and I'm, I'm getting better, but it does take an incredibly long time. So we've got two episodes down, hopefully three more by the end of October, and then we shall brand and release to the world. Rena, that's it. Do you wanna sum her up? So just to summarize, um, I think what we're really focusing on here is to build open learning is not just to to look for those OERs and adapt them, but it's to make them and create them and consider co-design, especially with your students. So then the students and the instructors learn together. Thank you. And I think, uh, Nicole, any last notes? No, I think that's it. If we've got any questions, I've got lots going on in the chat that I'm trying to. Yeah, we're trying to we so, did a, we so, couldn't read the chat. Um, I might go through some of those or let, um, yeah. Thank you so much, Verena and Nicole. And this was very, very interesting. Um, and we're coming up with a different point. And I like the idea that it was about students because we do forget about students when we are busy with doing our work. And, and that's the truth. We think that this is something very good that we are doing and students will just come in and do it. And when they don't do it, we don't understand why they're not doing it. But I really, really like your, your focus on, your, on, on students. And the other thing that you talked about was open for whom? Because yes, if we are not careful, we'll find ourselves in the same situation that we are in. Those that have resources will continue to, to give the resources out. And then again, um, I know in developing context, they talk about colonialization of knowledge. And, and maybe we need to guard against that if we want to be inclusive because it, well, central to open education is inclusivity. So if it's inclusive, then we need to, to talk about that. There's someone who asked the question, I think, regarding the transcripts. Kari gives, uh, do you make transcripts available for all podcasts at the time of release? I think this is a very good idea if you haven't thought about it, because then you have to think about students with hearing impairment and or, or, or students who are coming from other contexts where they may not they may not hear your voice properly so they need to go through it and 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 listen so that they can be able to understand what you're trying to to say so that's from carry gifts what do you what do you say about that well, I think the really important aspect here is accessibility isn't only about what we're talking about, access like UDL or universal design for learning to support all students in accessing the content. Accessibility is also about having the infrastructure and support for all students to have access to what we're talking about. So even as we were creating the podcast, for example, yes, we, we have created transcripts and we've figured out how to best support our students in that way. We've also tried to figure out how how to best make trans or make podcasts with different digital tools so that they're actually open and accessible to all. So that whole idea of open for whom has always been in our thoughts. And I think that's why we started with our Indigenous acknowledgement, because in Canada, many of our Indigenous students do not have the infrastructure and, ac and access to learning that some of our urban students might have. So there, there's different aspects of open for whom in different ways. There's the social justice perspective, there's mm -hmm. equality. 
different voices, but that accessibility has really become a really interesting topic as we've been researching and completing um, this project. Would you agree, Nicole, or yeah, your voice um, is important? Here. Yeah, abso absolutely. It was from the beginning, we really wanted to, or I definitely wanted to include uh, even other languages. Um, and that I'm realizing as we go, just how enormous it is, especially for two yeah. people to do. Um, I'd love to have, we have the transcriptions done in English. I'd love to be able to sit down and translate them. Like even just that right there opens, but I'm limited because I mean, I speak some Spanish, a little bit of German and, and some Portuguese, but that still, even with that just limits me. So it's also in a way looking at how it can maybe sit with Gojian and expand and grow. So you can bring those other voices in that are maybe at a a better place to access other people. Like right now, I, I welcome, I have nobody yet because I don't have those connections and now hopefully I do from Africa, but hearing what's going on in Uganda, like that to me is what I want to amplify because we don't always hear that um, up here in, in the, the great, great far, far north. So just being able to reach out through these contexts and through these conferences are great, but I think with podcasting, you blow that open to the next level. It's not just like I have to pay and be able to go to a conference now as a student, or if I'm curious about open, I can, I can listen to that online. I'm, I'm free to go to the GoGN website or wherever this gets hosted and hear about this project in Uganda. And that gets me really excited. I don't have to go to a conference for that. Good. Thank you very much, Nicole. Um, there are lots of questions here that are not even questions, suggestions. And yeah. then there's a number of suggestions on how to make transcripts from from audio, you know, yeah. but still, I think all, all of them are saying editing is a labor of love. Yeah. It's, it's, it's hectic. It really, really, really <laughs> is hectic. It's a labor of love. Um, I, I think it'll be interesting to see that progression because the first couple are rough. I'm not going to lie. So hopefully you see my skills improve. as <laughs> my go. I think it's um, important to mention the intentional open learning design as well. So everything we've done, we have tried to intentionally make it so it can be adaptable, transcripts, anything that's created, because we, we want to think about how hard it is. Like, that's why we're taking the time to do this, because we realize mm -hmm. it is very time consuming to actually make open education resources. However, when, when the students made them themselves, then they started to understand what is copyright? Why is it even important? It had no meaning to them until they actually used and created and had were expected to add those kind of, or, or consider, they didn't always add them, those kinds of licenses. Mm -hmm. and, and what tools to use, like all those questions. Yeah, as I see them all in here. It, it's hugely time consuming. It's not <laughs> free. It's a labor of this whole Invisible open education labor, is yeah. a labor of love. Yeah. yeah. And and that I think too, as a student just getting involved in this too, is is a question I have about the sustainability. One area we yeah. did want to touch on was the whole idea of reciprocity. So when you start out, I think you you're really happy to take. You're like, awesome, these resources are here. I can use them. But then I think it's another stage to be able to create them yourself and, and put that time, energy and effort in. And again, I go back to it in some ways doing that and sharing if you're not sponsored or you don't have a fellowship, like I'm very fortunate Gojian is helping, but I can't necessarily afford to do that. So it's the sustainability of it really is interesting to me because I do want to see this continue and go. I've benefited immensely from, from OER and from OEP, but it's how do you keep that going? Yeah, and it's not yeah. all about the take, it's about how you give back, which is just as important. And I think that that's what we emphasize with our open educational practices. Mm -hmm. Alexandra actually says, um, uh, related to the discussion of transcription, it's useful to remember that much work <laughs> or open education work is invisible labor, often less glamorous and more effective than, say, science. Um, uh, yeah. So, no, so for that's, sure. very, yeah. that's a very interesting point. And, and maybe my belief is um, in line with this, until we go back to education for teaching and learning, because education has, you know, gradually moved away from teaching and learning. There's nothing wrong with research. But, but again, you need to put emphasis on certain things when the legs are not equal, then there's a, there's a problem there. When the, the mission legs 
are not equal. There's a problem there. So people will tend to focus on something that they're going to benefit from. And I think even um, other, other, other speakers, other presenters refer to that, that if people are, if, if you benefit from something, then you're likely to go that route and then leave out this, because this is very interesting. But when you get um, staff, staff always say, well, um, I have, you know, I have to do research in order for me to be promoted, in order for me to get this. So again, if these things are not added into reward system of universities, we'll keep on having problems and a few people who are doing it with passion. I think that that too is why bringing students in was so powerful. So me being a part of that entire creation process and, and co-designing an OER, it's not just on the instructor then or on one individual who's working at the university. They're then teaching me how to be able to do that. And so if that becomes an interest area, I now have some of those skills and an understanding of open or even of copyright or creative commons. I never had that before. So going through the process, I learned those skills as a student. And now if I choose to, which I have, I can continue and apply that in, in different areas. And I think that keeps going. It's not just the idea that opens important, but it's, again, we're talking about capacity building. I now feel as a, like I have the capacity and understanding to be able to go, okay, I want to push this podcasting project, or I want to push it in this area. Let's give it a, give it a shot or give it a try. And so I think that's, what it comes down to with capacity building for us, it, it, that co-design was enormous because you're affecting, now you have 50 students and, and say half of them go out into the world and, and now understand how to create and contribute, you're helping with that, that cycle. I, I agree with you that you can't focus on the tenure behind this for me. <laughs> so for me, the goal, the, I, this is an example of, of um, sustainable, like a learning ecosystem in open and the impact is that others will be able to share and it won't all be on me at my university for example and i think that i've seen that around the world and, and modified that approach but i do agree that it doesn't exactly benefit me i'm still an adjunct professor i'm still a sessional i, I do, those those kind of rewards aren't there for me yet but I, I'm a teacher first, so nothing makes me happier. I've been teary right now having Nicole, you know, be here with me and knowing that she's sharing the love of open learning for others. And so I have to prioritize, and that's more important because sharing is education and sharing is caring. True, true. And we are in education because we are in a sharing Yeah, <laughs> that's weird to be in a reason. Itself, yeah. It's about yeah. sharing. Yes. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here if we were not about sharing. No. Exactly. Um, Alan, Alan has a nice comment here. Uh, he says, when I taught media classes, the one student said they worried about the most, they worried about the most was audio. I suspect it was that common dread of hearing our own voice until they learned about editing audit, audio can be like text, copy, paste, and the art of layering sounds uh, to create sound, soundscape, backgrounds, sound, you know, background sounds, effects, audio. So all those things, um, you will read that, but I thought it was quite interesting. Audio yeah, story storytelling is underappreciated for what it takes to create a rich experience. And I'm thinking of oral cultures, cultures that are really embedded in oral culture. Storytelling is yeah. one area where exactly. people actually um, come, go, 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 go with, understand the story better. When Jeru was speaking here, she start, he started with the analogy of, of a cook. So it was a story that he told, but that story was telling us about what OER is, what the services are, all those things that are needed. So thank you so, so much, colleagues. My, my clock is thank ringing. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> thank you ringing. so much, but please go thank to you. the chat and, and add what you can add. And then our last speaker for a day, and for me, it is eight o'clock at night, and maybe for many other people, other people it's in the morning, but our last speaker who's standing between me and my bedtime is uh, Brian McGarry and Christina Riemann Murphy, who will be talking about building stakeholder capacity for OER use and creation 
through a multi-tiered system-wide faculty development plan for open education at Penn State University. Over to you, Brian and Christina. Thank you. And we will not go too long so that you can get to bed. <laughs> <laughs> don't, um, worry about me. don't worry about me in bed. <laughs> <laughs> um, my name is Christina Raymond Murphy, um, and I'm the Sally W. Callum Librarian for Learning Innovations, and I'm a reference and instruction librarian at Penn State University at the Abington campus, which is outside of Philadelphia and Pennsylvania. Hi, I'm Brian McGeary. I'm the Learning Design and Open Education Engagement Librarian at Penn State University. So we'd like to begin by acknowledging that the lands we are presenting separately on, we're on opposite sides of the state of Pennsylvania, um, are from the traditional territories of the Shawnee and Lenni Lenape peoples. However, Penn State University is a land grant institution, and thus its campuses are located across the entirety of Pennsylvania and on the homelands of many tribes. And we acknowledge and honor the traditional caretakers of these lands and strive to understand and model their responsible stewardship. We wanna thank you for staying, staying on till the end of this session um, to listen to us talk about how at Penn State, we're building stakeholder capacity for OER use and creation through a multi-tiered system-wide faculty development plan for open education. I think we probably all know, or many of us know that faculty development around OER is complex and multifaceted. Um, and so Brian and I are just here to share how we are building capacity for that when it comes to faculty development around OER. So we're gonna share our context and our goals, and then the five steps we took during this process. I wanna give a shout out to Jeff Gallant, who's here. Um, Jeff Gallant, I'm sorry, who is from um, Affordable Learning Georgia, who was our mentor um, for the SPARC Leadership Program, where we primarily have the support to do this work um, at Penn State Libraries. And we also hope you're gonna leave with, so one possible model for how to do this at your institution, um, along with a resource to do that. And if you're tweeting, please use the hashtag OE Global and you can tag our handles, which are up on that screen. So just to give you the context, Penn State's Open and Affordable Educational Resources Working Group is currently undertaking a strategic planning process for OER services and support. There are a number of early OER initiatives going back actually um, probably almost 20 years now at Penn State, led by various disciplinary units that were the results of early efforts to improve distance education um, when that was a new thing, right? Um, but the value of open and affordable educational resources to both distance and residential students quickly became apparent. Um, and I think we all know that it even more emphasized when we were all temporarily distant. Um, traditional affordability models run out of university libraries and our teaching and learning with technology unit led to a more direct support for funding and faculty development for adopting, adapting, and creating OER through a number of different grant, grant funded, funded models. Um, and so after several years of these standalone programs, these individual focused faculty development programs and these grant funded models, the working group really wanted to take lessons learned from all these experiences and combine them um, with ideas on, based on open education initiatives happening elsewhere in order for us to develop long-term strategic support for our stakeholders at Penn State. Um, across all of the campuses, which I think we have, I always go back, it depends on who you count. We have something like anywhere from 22 to 24 campuses plus world campus. So as fellows in the SPARC Open Education Leadership Program, we structured our collaborative capstone to support this work. And our overall goal was to create a plan for scalable faculty engagement for both us and the faculty and various professional development initiatives that would help us continue to support individual faculty while also developing some more collaborative open education programs that span our units and our campuses and our locations. Um, so we're, Brian and I are also part of a small faculty development working group composed of individuals from university libraries and teaching and learning with technologies who were the most heavily involved in revisioning Penn State's open education initiative, initiatives. And that group is working on a plan, but ultimately the plan, plan that Brian and I worked on that covers the following five goals. So this is what we decided very on. Um, our five goals cover, first of all, faculty intake and onboarding. How do we bring them in and how do we move them through the faculty development they need in a way that makes sense and helps us keep track of them? Um, and that was scalable for us too. Right now, a lot of it was individually happening through email um, or people were part of a program, but there's no larger model. So that was our one goal, streamline some intake and onboarding. Our second goal was to design and develop a scaffolded approach that supports all different types of OER labor, adapting, authoring, creating, um, but also that introduces open pedagogical 
open pedagogical practices, and centers diversity, equity, and inclusion. Third goal was that we really needed a robust communication and outreach plan, um, thinking like wondering if we needed to create a network of people involved in this. In order to meet any of these goals, we also had a fourth goal, which is to upscale additional instructional designers and librarians from across all of the colleges and campuses who can support this additional faculty development. Um, right now we have a few people who this is their position, but we don't have a whole OER team that's designated as a team. We're really looking forward to taking advantage of the huge number of people that we have at Penn State. And finally, of course, assessment is always important. Um, we wanted to develop a strategic approach to assessment um, because what we were doing was minimal to determine various impact. Of course, cost savings is always an impact, but student learning as well is something that's really important to us as we started this process. And so once we established our scope, um, we completed a review of strategic plans at Penn State, which is always a good place to start, right? To look at your own documentation in order to make sure that our efforts which we were about to undertake across these 10 months would clearly align with institutional priorities and ultimately which would help us make the case for the resources necessary to ensure long-term viability of our efforts. So we determined areas, and those are the ones that you can see on the right side of the slide here, um, areas of these strategic plans, which explicitly either called out OER or other terminology and goals that related to our planning efforts, like affordability. So they, many, most of them did not say OER, but a number of them talked about the affordability and the cost of a Penn State education. Many of them mentioned access, teaching and learning, um, pedagogy, sustainability in terms of um, sustainable educational plans. Um, and so then we went through and we reviewed it and coded the strategic plans for all 22 campuses. But there was also a strategic plan for one Penn State 2025, which is the university's goal moving forward. And university libraries also has its own strategic plan. <laughs> so we went through 24 strategic plans and then we created this beautiful chart that mapped the plans to the components that we coded, which I will show you now. No need to like get close yet. It's a lot on a very small text, but just to give you an idea of what we did, those are all the uh, units and campuses on the left um, that we looked at their strategic plan. And then across the right are those instances that we were looking for, that affordability, access, teaching, all those things. Um, we weren't trying to score you know, how good any campuses or units strategic plan was. That wasn't what we were looking for. We were more looking for how often are these things appearing across all the campuses at Penn State. Um, and so the big ones that came up were affordability and cost was often mentioned. So if you're doing this at your campus, um, you know, an OER isn't in anybody's strategic plans, then affordability can be a good way, right, to, um, to get at some of these things. Teaching, of course, was very highly mentioned. Learning and student engagement was very high, as well as innovation, um, right? And OER can often be seen as innovative or talked about as innovative. And then finally, collaboration was really important because that was one of our goals. How could we make this happen across more Penn State campuses and how can more units work together to advance these efforts? So once we did that, um, we conducted a SWOT analysis. And maybe we should have done the SWOT analysis first, but this is just the order that we did it. <laughs> we realized that we probably needed to get a handle on what we were doing and what was working. Um, what were our strengths? If you're not familiar with the SWOT analysis, it comes from the business world. S stands for strengths, W stands for weaknesses, O stands for opportunities, and T stands for threats, which always feels harsh, but there are threats. Um, and so we did a SWOT analysis for both the state of OER at Penn State, and we also did a separate one for our existing faculty development program. And so I just highlighted some of the things here, right? We have administrative support in terms of successes. We're aligning with strategic plans, that's great. We have an open liaison program um, for librarians. So uh, we already have a small network um, and we have support for faculty development, which is great. And they have gone well. Our weaknesses, as I mentioned before, we don't have a lack of dedicated OER unit or we don't have a dedicated OER unit. We need additional human resources to scale up. And as you mentioned in the previous um, presentation, and I love that resource that y'all mentioned, the doers, um, I think collaborative work about promotion and tenure. OER work is not currently recognized in, in, in promotion and tenure at Penn State. Some of our opportunities, however, is that Penn State's 2025 strategic plan does use the word OER, which is great, right? That was awesome for us. Um, there's donor interest in OER, which is always important. And the existing faculty development materials that we've multiple units have created are easily adaptable. We can do things with them. Some of our threats that we saw for Penn State is that subscription textbook models continue to be popular for faculty. Um, personnel turnover, right? Our human um, resources can always potentially be a threat. COVID um, 
I guess you could put, I never want to say that COVID was an opportunity, right? But it certainly um, showed the importance of OER, as some of y'all have mentioned. And then finally, uh, uh, you know, contingent faculty are not a threat, but a threat to an OER program is that contingent faculty are often the most ardent participants, but they're also the most at risk, right? Which impacts sustainability. So once we did our SWOT analysis, I'm going to turn it over to Brian for our next step. All right. Um, so to kind of help us look for some further areas to improve our efforts at Penn State, um, we also gathered information about uh, open education faculty development happening at, at our, our peer institutions. Um, and so this part of the process for us included both like looking at the scholarly literature on this topic, but also um, looking at institutional websites to, to learn more about the initiatives happening at those institutions. And so in order to kind of have a realistic scope for what we were doing, we decided to uh, limit our website reviews to just institutions that were um, members of the Big Ten Academic Alliance, which is a consortium that Penn State belongs to. And it's what uh, administrators at our institution often point to as, as kind of our, our peer group for, for comparison purposes. Um, so that, me that means a lot to them. Um, and we also looked at websites of a few additional uh, relevant peers it's sort of in our, our regional area. Um, in addition to that, you know, we were, we were looking for any kinds of uh, noteworthy programs that, that we came across, um, you know, through our, through our professional network. So maybe things that we saw in a listserv or that uh, we heard about a, a, at a conference like OE Global, um, you know, lots of sorts of informal means of, of learning about um, programs that, that folks are doing. Um, and so then from all of that information gathering, we were able to uh, come up with kind of a a category, 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 why can I say, not say that word today, categorization of uh, all of these different kinds of initiatives. Um, so whether that's, you know, workshops, faculty learning circles, uh, asynchronous courses, digital badges, lots of different things like that. So we kind of took all of these things, categorized them and um, documented uh, any ones that seemed particularly noteworthy or, you know, things that we might be able to implement in our own context. Um, so a, a few of the things that, that we came up with that, that we'd like to implement beyond the things that we're already doing um, are a social justice uh, grant program. So having, uh, you know, monetary support for OER projects that are really aimed at um, encouraging the uh, creation of OER that, that promote uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. Um, also having a cohort-based uh, fellowship program centered around open pedagogy, which is a, a big area of interest for Christina and I. Um, and uh, also a high impact uh, grant program that, that's targeting more sort of at the departmental or program level, uh, you know, with a, a massive institution like Penn State in order to be able to, to make a, a really big kind of impact, um, you know, we, we want to try to aim for, for some of those larger level uh, approaches. Um, also, uh, an asynchronous online course for Penn State's world faculty or world campus faculty development um, that would be focused specifically on open education. And also a series of digital badges um, covering different aspects of, of open education so that faculty or other folks who are involved in OER at Penn State, whether that's, you know, folks within libraries or instructional designers and, and so forth, um, ways for them to, to learn about open education. And so, you know, it's, it's not enough to uh, just have us come up with these initiatives that we think are worthwhile. It's also important to identify the things that faculty um, are saying that they need or that they have demonstrated that they need um, through our different initiatives that we've already done. Um, so we looked back at our existing initiatives and saw common themes that, that come up in terms of uh, what faculty need for professional development or support with uh, adopting, adapting, creating OER. Um, we also want to do sort of a more formal uh, creating uh, faculty personas to help us further in our uh, development of a, a train the trainer model that we're trying to put together for uh, disciplinary faculty 
and faculty uh, within the university libraries. Um, and we're also going to do some further information gathering about the, the kinds of faculty development approaches that our faculty are most interested in, um, you know, whether that's synchronous uh, versus asynchronous or individual versus cohort or, you know, badging and, and other types of uh, micro credentialing. And so using the, the information that we've gathered throughout all of these different stages that we've talked about thus far, um, we were able to generate a map of various faculty development programs, uh, both uh, ones that we're, we would be continuing that we're already doing and new ones that, that we've come up with um, and you know, trying to figure out what are the things that we would like to move forward with at Penn State. Um, and so the, the map that we came up with identifies uh, the logistical characteristics of all of these different uh, programs as well as the human, technical, and financial resources that would be involved in making each of those happen. Um, and it also indicates where those different programs would be aligned with the different uh, faculty development working groups, five goals that, that Christina mentioned earlier, um, and uh, with the, the faculty needs as well that we've identified throughout the process. Um, and uh, this map also discusses the next steps that we have, you know, specifically looking at uh, concerns related to scalability and also potential timelines for implementing each of these as we're trying to figure out, you know, where to prioritize our efforts initially and, um, you know, in the future. And so on this slide, you'll see just a, a snippet of uh, what our program map actually looks like. Um, as I mentioned, we, we broke things down by logistical characteristics and the, the people, the funding, the infrastructure that, that it needs to be carried out. Um, we also mapped each one of these initiatives to our faculty development goals. And um, we've begun figuring out what the next steps are going to be and putting together a timeline for all of that. Um, this process is still in progress and our, our group is uh, you know, looking more closely at specifically the initiatives to prior prioritize for uh, this fall and for the spring semester. And so going back to the, the five goals that Christina mentioned earlier on, here are some specific ways that we're moving forward with each of those goals in light of the work that, that we've described today in this presentation. Um, in terms of the intake and onboarding of faculty, we're uh, sunsetting the, the Penn State OER listserv that we've been using. And instead we're, we're moving over to uh, integrating uh, an OER focused queue within uh, LibAnswers, the virtual reference system that, that we use um, at our library. And typically this platform, we're just using it within the university libraries, but because of the fact that we have uh, colleagues external to the libraries who are really key collaborators in all of this work, um, we're adding them in, in as well. And this will really help us to much more easily kind of manage and triage questions and, and consultation requests from faculty so that we're making sure that not only you know, are, are these questions being addressed, but also making sure that the right people are being brought into these conversations. Um, as I mentioned, um, you know, we're prioritizing initiatives that we want to move forward with. And so this uh, includes revising our existing faculty development so that our colleagues can replicate it, you know, which would help us to make it more scalable. Um, we also want to pilot some uh, faculty development around open pedagogy, as I mentioned. And we're also uh, more explicitly building DEI into all of our faculty development initiatives. Um, in terms of communication and outreach, uh, we have a student intern who is helping us uh, to develop a student-facing marketing and awareness plan. Um, you know, we've already done a lot in terms of uh, faculty awareness and marketing, but that's a piece of it that we need to do a bit more work on. Um, we're also building a, a communication and outreach network of faculty who are already doing OER uh, things at Penn State and bringing in more faculty who are, who are interested um, in getting involved in this kind of work. Um, in terms of upskilling, you know, we, we also want to upskill our colleagues so that uh, we can spread the labor out and make things more scalable. 
So we're creating a, a network of OER leads that will include librarians and instructional designers in particular. Um, and we'll be doing a variety of different professional development programs to really uh, help build their expertise and their capacity to, to replicate some of the, uh, the work that Christina and I and, and some of our other colleagues have already been doing. Um, in terms of assessment, there, there's a few things that are important that we're doing. Um, one, we're uh, trying to create a more comprehensive way of calculating cost savings at Penn State so that all the different initiatives that we're doing, um, we're getting uh, a number that is uh, a bit less kind of dodgy. Um, also, one of our colleagues created um, an automated way of collecting faculty course material uh, and, the, and the accompanying pricing uh, data that goes with that so that we can have a clearer sense of who's using open and affordable materials at Penn State and the, the, the cost savings associated with that. We're not yet in a situation where we have uh, course marking happening at Penn State. So it's uh, been a bit more laborious to, to try to get a handle on that, that information. But um, this uh, automated bot that he came up with um, is gonna help us a lot with that. Um, also, we're uh, looking to study the, the potential learning impact on Penn State students uh, from the use of OER. So that will give us you know, uh, an aspect of this that isn't just focused on uh, cost savings, which of course is important. I'm not trying to downplay that, but um, we also really wanna you know, look at the, at the learning impact that this has on students. And so if, if you'd like to replicate the, the process that, that we implemented, um, you can use this openly licensed faculty development uh, program planning guide that we created, um, which is one of our uh, capstone projects for the, the Spark Open Education Leadership Program. Um, we'll be presenting about our other capstone, actually the uh, Open Pedagogy Project Roadmap on Wednesday um, during webinar 13 on inclusive and equitable OER. Um, it's in the same time slot as uh, the session today. So if you're interested in checking that out, um, we hope to see you there as well. But uh, there's a, a brief link there to the uh, faculty development program planning guide. Uh, it's openly licensed, so feel free to use it as, as uh, fit your purposes. And um, that's all we have for today. So thank you for attending. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you very much. There are quite a number, not questions, I think, they are mostly um, comments. And there was a comment on your last name, Christina, <laughs> and you responded to it nicely. If I can tell you about, if I can just give you my, made a name you'll never even start with it so it's fine <laughs> <laughs> yeah thank and you. Brian, can you make sure you put the right i put the right link in there i put the bitly link in there but i don't know if the other link is the, the sharepoint much longer link is the better one to put in there so okay yeah sure i can put that. thanks yeah and, thanks and there's someone who i think let me just get in here who talked about teaching itself is only vaguely um it's, it's only vaguely uh, recognized in a lot of promotion and tenure processes. And that is true everywhere. And, and that's, that's, that's the problem. But I think while, while she, that, that the person has written this, I want to raise something that I thought was very interesting in your presentation, was that even when you're dealing with faculty, you, are, you, are, you have a social justice grant program, which I think for me, it, it stands out. And it's something that maybe probably universities can look at because the, the social justice mandate is looking at issues of accessibility, um, inclusivity, you, you know, all those, it, it, its principles are based on accessibility, are based on inclusivity, are based on equitability, which is, I think, the most important part, because we tend to think that if, every, if we put material online, everybody has equal access to it. But you are talking about how to build that to, to a point where everyone has equitable access. I like that. Um, can you talk a little bit about it? And what does yeah, it I mean, mean that's, in terms so of that's promotion our, and tenure? Yeah, so I mean, that's both of those areas, I'd say we have work to do. 
at Penn State, right? We, so we really looked at the models out there that we thought were doing a great job. That was part of our benchmarking where we could be doing better. Um, Penn State currently has um, a, a repository for OER, but that's housed through the Earth and Mineral Sciences um, College, because that's where a lot of the OER started. That's becoming the Penn State repository. And a central tenet of that is it has to be accessible. Um, mm. That's it's, it's important. That's like it's going to go through everything. We'll go through reviews that is there. We looked at um, the BCC Open Campus, right? Like a lot of us talked about how we love their repository. It's simple, but you can, here's how you can edit it. Here's how you can download it. Here's you know all these different formats that you can get it. Um, and, and it's also transparent that it's gone through an accessibility checklist, or some items haven't yet, right? So there's a transparency around that too. Um, so that those are things that we're keeping in mind um, for us. So um, to make things equitable, because we. You know, parts of Penn State are, um, there's so many campuses, a lot of them are in areas with pretty bad broadband access. And so mm -hmm. um, that's, you know, you don't necessarily think it, but we do have, so we have to make sure that anything we're creating can meet the needs of all of our students. But of course, that also helps so many other students, anybody else that might be using the resource as well. Interesting. Brian, did you want to mention the promotion and tenure? I don't know. You want to handle that? Just the promotion and tenure question. I'd say that's an area we have work to do too. <laughs> and, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, and it it really varies so much from one unit to another in terms of um, because different uh, colleges, uh, you know, even the university libraries, they they all uh, have their own criteria that, that they've established for for promotion and tenure. And so to try to get all of those different units to agree mm -hmm. to, to some sort of credit for uh, OER work, uh, I think is probably going to take a bit more of a top-down kind of effort to, to make that happen. Um, and mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's certainly mm -hmm. something that, that our uh, university-wide OER working group is, is working on. But um, yeah, there's, there's still a long way to go. Yeah, some small things we've done for the grant that I run at my campus, we provide all the faculty that participate a letter, right, so that they can um, include that letter in their dossier or their promotion and tenure materials. Um, we're also we're working on an across the camp uh, across the campuses an OER Champions Award to again give some recognition, you know, create a thing that you can put in your your review, right? That I want an award for this, things like that to just kind of elevate it. But that's where the strategic plan becomes important. Too, you know, like it's super not fun reading strategic plans, but they are important. <laughs> and then, you know, I mean, I think even for Brian and I, we were on then a strategic planning process, and like you see the importance of getting these this OER stuff in there. So if you're in a position to influence those kinds of institutional documents, they do, they do help, right? Because that's where the faculty then look to well, what should I be doing, and that's where administrators look to to guide you. And so I think those things are helpful for also promotion and tenure. But that other resource, the doers. I can't remember what it's called, Collaborative, is such a great resource. And we found that really helpful. So whoever put that link in there, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and I, well, I can't ask more about the social, for, for your scalable approach, because I think it was, it's, it's really wonderful to, to deal with so many campuses and still try to reach the faculty development in an equitable way. Because the problem is that some who are in remote places never get support you know those that have access to connectivity and all those things will be able to get uh, support but those that are really in remote spaces will not be able to get support but since we are left with very little time one minute to be precise and um, all all that is left of me is to thank you from the bottom of my heart this has been a very very interesting um session if i have to say that um, it was interesting. We learned so many new things from students' perspective to, to developing strategies for faculty to, to ensuring that even people, young people in developing contexts are encouraged to get into the STEM. So there are so many issues that, that we, we, we were dealing with. We even went into the cooking analogy that was un unbelievable. That was absolutely, absolutely. And, and if, if I may, uh, can I use it, Gary? And then I will, uh, and then you give me the license for it. That's fine. 
if, if it's acceptable, because I think that for me was spot on in terms of what OER is. And, and just to explain to people in layman's terms, because that has been a difficulty. That has been a difficulty. So um, we have heard about um, faculty development. We've heard about OER courses, but thank you so much. The last, the last need is Ido is our, Ido Diayole is, is our repertoire. So please send him all the information that you have so that he can be able to put this glowing report that I can see is happening. Thank you again, colleagues, and have a lovely, lovely day for those who are in America and Canada. And, and I can tell you, this day is a beautiful day because I'm going to an end of it. So rest assured, whatever that is left, you are going to have a great day. I've already had a great day already. Thank you so much, colleagues. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you, everyone. Thank you very thank much. You. Yeah, really appreciate you. Hope we, hope we keep in touch together. And we can keep communicating and sharing ideas together. Thank you.